Thank you everyone for tuning in to our latest Kudos Cast. This is episode 5 of season 3. And on that note, uh, and on today's Kudos Cast, I am delighted to be joined by IT industry veteran and investor Pete Kastner. Pete, welcome Thank to you, the Kudos Pete. Cast. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Beautiful day in Savannah, Georgia, in the United States. I'm so pleased to hear that. And it's, it's the same down here in Bournemouth on the south coast. The, mm -hmm. uh, the spring sunshine has finally broken through. Excellent. Everyone's got a smile on their face walking by. That's so, uh, yeah, really glad to have you here. And, and sorry for, you know, uh, introducing you as a veteran because, you know, we can all tell you you're in your mid-20s and you still got, you know, right. plenty of years of IT and uh, technology growth to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I've been in the industry over 50 years. It's kind of hard to hide it. Uh, I still have my hair and I'm happy for that. So... Uh, over that time, I was a developer and a systems integrator, and that got me into vertical marketing as a computer company marketing executive. Uh, and that led me to become the chief research officer and co-founder of a technology market research firm, where for 20 years, I kind of watched everything, including, and specifically the software space, uh, but watched all the major trends that happened from the 90s through, uh, into the 21st century. So today I mostly focus on helping startup companies, including making inv angel investments. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean, there's some, I mean, I can't wait to start digging into some of the, uh, you know, to that, some of the, the bits that you've been working through uh, throughout the years. And, 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 and also, you know, really importantly, and, and the reason why we wanted to bring you onto the Kudos cast today was to, you know, just to get your kind of thought leadership, really, because um, there's been many technology waves um, you know, in the 50 years you said you've been in IT, there's been many top, not technology ways, but they all seem to be kind of, you know, they all seem to have a, like a, like a halving now, don't they? So they, you know, once every 20 years to 10 years to five years to two and a half years. And I think, yeah. you know, now it's particularly in the blockchain space, we're seeing it like every week it feels like. Oh so. my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, just quickly, when I started in the industry in the late 1960s, you could read Datamation magazine once a month and be completely up to date with the computer industry, take August off to go to the shore and still not miss anything. Now, virtually, you can spend 24 hours a day just watching the technology changes in the crypto sub-segment of a very large half a, tr uh, well, semiconductors alone is a half a trillion dollar business. So it's too big for me and my brain exploded. <laughs> distributed <laughs> or well, decentralized they'll probably say <laughs> <There you go. laughs> uh, fantastic so um, you know how, how did you hear about kudos because it was kind of a bit of a, a chance conversation I think that we had about four weeks ago and mm -hmm. um, and it was a brilliant conversation that's why we brought you back onto the you know onto the kudos cast today and thanks for joining but yeah how, how was it you originally heard about kudos uh, in retrospect it was serendipity I was looking to do staking last year, decided to get some income, did that on my own a few times and realized that the steps that the average person has to go through to buy the right coin, to have some ether in a wallet that's compatible with the coins, to pay outrageous gas fees to do all of this. And so I stumbled upon this Baltic company by the name of mycoincontainer.com where you send them uh, money and press a button and they stake it for you. Now, whether I can get my money back or not, I haven't tried that, but let's just say it works. Uh, and they had just announced a partnership with this organization called Kudos. And I said, well, that's interesting. Let's just find out what they do because Kudos uh, is looking to do uh, open compute in a, in a blockchain Web3 environment. I said, well, that's, that's very interesting. There's the potential for a, a real business behind that. And I, I looked it up and found out that I had some connections with uh, the, the uh, validator that I chose when I uh, staked some kudos. And uh, from there, I got put in touch with you and others at uh, Kudo Ventures, and here I am. Fantastic. I, I love that story. And it's um, you're very much uh, appreciated as well that you're helping to, to, to lock value into our network, which is essentially what, you know, kind of proof of stake is and, and how a proof of stake network secures itself as well. So, um, yeah, I think I think you're the first guest that I've had on the Kudos cast that, is, that has come through that path as well. So, um, 
Um, brilliant. Yeah, more more of them. I'm sure they're going to all be flooding in now, and we're going to be having uh, you know big teams on here. But it's uh, yeah, very very interesting. And, and what's your what's your um, uh, I mean, was that your first staking experience as well, or have you have you kind of got involved in kind of other DeFi platforms that are, are uh, I, staking or yield farming? I think I have stakes. Some of them are quite small in maybe ten or twelve different currencies. Uh, some are more deliberate than others and uh, haven't done anything since, of course, a week or two after making those investments, fourth quarter of last year, crypto goes in, and so we're just going to see where it goes. But in the meantime, I'm earning interest. Absolutely, absolutely. And as I say to all of my friends that ask me on a, on a kind of minutely basis, especially when they start seeing the red numbers, you know, come up instead of the green numbers, you look at that kind of long-term trend, you know, the bottom line of the long-term trend, um, that's a, that's a, that's a that's a good metric to kind of follow and, and kind of you know just zoom out as well on on those graphs and you know you look at the likes of Bitcoin, and Ethereum, and the, the other ones that have been around a, uh, a lot longer than kind of newer projects like us, and you, you kind of see that bottom line. And uh, generally speaking, it's 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 you know it's always on the way up. But it's not financial advice, by the way, everyone. It's just to of course keep calm. Bear markets happen. Bull markets happen. Exactly. You know, it is the cycle of a it was a cycle of market. But the, the other point about staking is, of course, that you're becoming part of the network. You need stakes in order to uh, put enough financial resources behind the validators who are the ones who keep the blockchain. And that's the engine of the entire enterprise, no matter what project you're working with. Absolutely. It's um... We, we refer to it in the industry as TVL, so total value locked, and it's a it's a kind of a it's a way of um, measuring how much value is locked into a network. When we're talking about proof of stake, this is you know uh, into a network. Um, so think of it as like um, uh, a bank, right? So the more accounts a bank has from different unique users, the more secure that bank is. Uh, typically speaking, so if we look back into kind of 2008 when there was a credit crunch, you know the bigger banks with the more with the more accounts, the more unique accounts, and the um, uh, within that, the more money being held within those accounts survives through that period. where so a lot of the smaller banks, you know, were either acquired or, or you know kind of had to close their doors. It's off. essentially the network effect, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it is indeed. Yeah, um, and. Uh, yeah, very interesting on the network effect. If, you, if you're not familiar with it, I'd highly recommend you know going on to um, uh, probably go on to YouTube and watch some videos. But you've got you've got you know uh, very influential people, not influencers, but very influential people in terms of you know their their credibility and their their, their history, um, such as Raoul Pohl, who does a, a lot on kind of network effects, and um, you know it's all very factual rather than opinion, but it's showing the how you can have uh, the kind of daily traded volume, uh, daily traded volume divided by the amount of users, and mm -hmm. that kind of is, um, you know, how you work out the, the network effect. So yeah, very interesting. I've, I've, I've slipped down that rabbit hole a few times. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As it, so um, the, I mean, tell, tell us about folding a home because when we had a conversation about four weeks at, uh, four weeks ago when we first met. And um, so you've been within this industry for a long time, but there's a, obviously a very keen kind of passion for, 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 for kind of computing. And, you know, as you said, being able to use um, your spare computing power to, for, for, for good causes. And that's how we got onto uh, Folding at Home. So, so what, firstly, what, what is Folding at Home? Let me start this way with the biology. Uh, proteins are the machines of life. Every living cell uh, does all kinds of work with multiple proteins and they constantly change shape and fold based on the atomic attraction or rejection of individual subatomic particles. So negative to negative would, would push away and plus to minus is going to, to attract. Uh, all this happens throughout our, the life of every living creature. So. The problem is that diseases can involve misfolding or the use of proteins as, as a weapon, as in the protein that is the spike at the tip of the COVID-19 virus. So uh, the only way to predict how proteins will, will interact is by massive computation, atom by atom, nanosecond by nanosecond. So my story is that mm, late 2000s, uh, 
Intel Corporation was giving me machines to evaluate. And when I called them up, they said, well, we don't want them back. And I said, what am I going to do with these machines sitting in my basement? So I found out about folding at home and started consuming electricity to do useful, scientific, charitable work. And now I find myself uh, in in the top, well, that, this week I'm producing in the top six in the whole project. And ahead of me, I, wow. I have VMware, the uh, Swiss Polytechnic Institute, Intel, and NVIDIA, and, and anonymous wow. users. That's incredible. Yeah, and are these all still in your basement? Are they, or have you, have you kind of spread the well, environment? Well, I, I live on a on an island, so we don't have basements. Uh, flooding is an issue, but I do have an attic yeah. full of computers. Oh, it's up in the attic! Brilliant, fantastic. I, I mean, that's 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 quite a uh, a contribution. So, I mean, I, I, I salute you, really. I mean, there's the the incredible work that that uh, all of those millions of or trillions of you know calculations that you've done over the years. Um, it's you know it's massively made an impact in kind of finding um, you know um, uh, cures for diseases or at least you know kind of prevention and and being able to to, to help that. So um, yeah, thank you from from everyone around the planet for your contribution. You're welcome, and you you can do it too. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. What's interesting is that the next version of folding at home that should be out soon, uh, it will have a a layer of software that allows uh, crypto tokens to interface with it. So this software will also be open sourced and therefore it'll become uh, indeed feasible for some open source developers to go out and uh, add to this platform and give people incentives to uh, to do some folding. That's a, that's actually really really incredible. I'm I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, it's it's something that as a you know as a as a project as as a business we have been uh, looking into a, a few times and we got um, uh, I mean the the first product that we actually launched as a as a kind of uh, Topco if you like. So mm -hmm. under under Kudo Ventures the the Topco was a, was a donation application called um, Do Kudo Donate, um, and the whole you know reason behind Kudo Donate was that as a uh, the spare power from your desktop, you know it might not be very profitable for you to 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 you know generate revenues for yourself if it's kind of a low powered machine. But actually, all of those pennies, all of those dollars, all of those you know pounds, wherever you are around the world, could contribute to um, uh, to, to, to to charity. We brought on a few pilot charities exactly and, you know, that that had some impact. What we what we what we want to do um, now is, um, and what we are going to do, should I say, is you know we're gonna. Um, within Kudo Compute, as that goes live, there will be the ability, won't be from day one, but it's on the roadmap, but there'll be the ability to be able to donate um, your computing resources um, as well. So um, one, it could be donations, one, it could actually be donating the computing resource. Um, so if it is a big project, say, I don't know, like um, uh, cancer research or Alzheimer's research or something that does need a lot of computing power. Actually, it might be um, better for them to have the computer power rather than the donations that could be um, that generated uh, from that. So yeah, very cool. And um, that's kind of um, very close to home for us. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, yeah, absolutely. So just, uh, I mean, right at the beginning, we talked about all these new technology waves and, you know, how they seem to be getting a bit like the weather, really, just more extreme by the, <laughs> with, with each wave that uh, will come. So with climate, shall I say. So how does, um, how does blockchain or Web3, if we were to kind of take a more generalized approach, compare, in your opinion, to, to, to past ones? Well, again, in, in my career, if I look at the major waves and you can to find them differently, but there was the mainframe where all the information had to come into the single source and then get passed out back to that individual unit. Uh, then the mini computer came along, which made it less expensive. But mini computers brought along terminals, which were character based at first, but then with PCs and smarter device. Now we started to get early 90s into client server computing. And then circa 95, we hit the internet, which added all sorts of things, starting with e-commerce. But eventually, we got more powerful servers. And that led to databases and the whole big data, data analytics thing. 
uh, in the last 20 years or f fewer, actually, uh, we've added, of course, sh the huge business of uh, gaming and entertainment, as well as artificial intelligence. And on top of that, the maturation of all of the applications that run on servers, but more importantly, can run on your PC today that you wouldn't even have conceived of running them a few years ago. So uh, Web3 and the blockchain, I look at it, they're, they're Legos. Remember the toy your children used to put together in a million different ways, an infinite number of ways. So we've got the blockchain, we've got all sorts of applications in the decentralized finance, the DeFi area, which I have dabbled in, but until I realized, wait a second, this whole project is about supporting hedge funds who are using algorithms you know, to buy sell ahead of the market. I know nothing about this, so I better not invest in it because I'm gonna lose my shirt again. Um, then you've got some of the, the biggest and most talked about areas uh, besides the whole Web3 infrastructure itself, which enables Lego-like almost anything. But we've got NF NFTs on the one hand and, and the metaverse on the other as two uh, uh, black holes sucking up enormous amount of uh, press as well as uh, investments. For not a yeah, lot of return, uh, I would add. Yeah, <laughs> it's coming. It's coming thick and fast. I think it is. Everything is so so early. I mean, uh, uh, we um, we're guilty sometimes as, uh, if we're working within the industry because because everything is moving so chaotically fast that um, you know you, you you kind of you kind of forget that everything's less than kind of three or four years, really. If, if we're talking about NFTs, metaverses, and I know blockchain's been around a bit longer, and you know cryptocurrencies as first uh, use case, but really still in that kind of maturity curve it, it, it was 2017 was that point where more people start to come in and start to be noticed but it's, it's this recent run in the kind of last 2021 and 2022 where you know the the uh, the wider industries are starting to now look at this and starting to come in and starting to to adopt it and we're you know we're, it's that network effect that you that you you referred to beforehand and um and uh, you, you you kind of take that scale up now and you and you can see that by you know, 2025, you've got you know something like one sixth of the world, and by 2030, you've got uh, nearly three thirds of the, the the world's population that will, uh, if it was on that kind of same um, uh, growth curve, logarithmic growth curve, um, then um, and and that's incredible, right? But it just highlights how early we still are within uh, within this industry. Correct, and uh, certainly from from my experience, the the early winners are not necessarily the long term winners. Recall that the first and uh, highly popular browser on the market was Netscape. But within five years, Netscape was replaced by this little Stanford graduate team called Google. What did they have? Mm -hmm. Well, they had a browser and search. Yeah, the, the history was written from there. So NFTs, for example, uh, um, I'm not going to buy a, a cartoon or something like that. It, it's it's absurd. On the other hand, if you if you look at what's going on and think about the technology and how it could be used, there is something there. So the NFT process could turn into a a personal ID, right? It's a, it's a crypto representation of me. Now maybe it's my face for example, and it could be used by national security systems, God forbid. But you, you get the point. There's something mm -hmm. in the uh, blockchain recordable, immutable nature of uh, things that would make NFTs down the road worthy of something. Uh, so, so you're not going to go out and buy a mutant ape or a, no. um, a crypto punk you know, uh, anytime soon? Because because it's already been thought of and the early money's already been made. It's like the fact that there are, what, 1,500 crypto tokens out there? Uh, or look at the metaverses, plural, right? Pete and Pete could go out and start a metaverse tomorrow and you know we'd have our own Mayfair and Champs-Élysées and Rodeo Drive. And we'd just sell that real estate until we realize that every other metaverse in the universe uh, had those same popular places trying to get people to spend real money. The best headline I saw this week was 
why buy a real house when you can buy a house in the metaverse for the same price? Well, I mean, I mean, in this current market, it actually sounds like a bargain. <laughs> uh, <yes. laughs> when you see some of the price, until it rains and you it. want a roof over your head. <laughs> anyway, crazy times and buyers beware as usual. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, a huge part of the. I think we're seeing a transition with NFTs now. Anyway, no, I, I know that we've had you know a few very very kind of uh, bullish guests on um, uh, with about NFTs before and and. Uh, and the other way as well. So, but I, th I think you know the N NFTs have got to start having a lot more utility, and I think they are starting. That is starting to come through, right? The the kind of early artwork, the JPEGs, uh, were something that everyone could relate to. But they, you know, everything grows up over time, and um, you know, like you said, you know, verifiable ID on chain. We, we know a couple of uh, uh, projects out there that are doing something very similar to that. Um, you know, fast forward. Five ten years, and I think we said it before. You, we're going to be buying houses, mortgages, and you know all, all of the kind of normal, boring, real ones, by the way, not metaverse ones. But you know all the kind of you know um, boring day to day, real life things. Um, you know could be uh, NFTs because they're a, a, a way to you know, certify something and, and make it unique. Um, as long as you get away from the crazy, you know, three hundred dollar gas fee each time uh, uh, right. to, 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 to create one well, of these, yeah. One of the key technologies, uh, I, I think, that's underappreciated at this point in the whole Web3 environment are smart contracts. The fact mm -hmm. that now the, the, the computer can match up the buy and the sell, the have you delivered, have is it at spec sort of thing, gets the human being out of the loop. We need mm -hmm. uh, uh, less check marking on clipboards when things are automatic and a neutral arbiter, namely the blockchain, can uh, can make things happen. Absolutely. And if you've got humans out of the loop, of course, humans have got more time to browse JPEGs. So everyone's a winner. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, let's, let's, let's move on a little bit. So, I mean, um, uh, I mean, you talked about kind of mainframe mini computers, you know, coming into the, uh, coming into the home in, uh, I guess the late 80s and 90s and then the internet connected again. So we point, we've basically gone from centralized mainframe to kind of decentralized, which is the home computers because they didn't have an, uh, an internet to connect them all at that point to then to back to centralized, I guess, because everything started moving into the cloud and now we're going the, the, the other way, right? So, so I mean, I'm, this is more architecturally, I guess I'm speaking from. But now we have more of this kind of philosophy around decentralization as well. And there's a real big movement of um, people, projects that want to, uh, you know, decentralize their data to, 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 for, for, to get rid of like kind of these big tech monopolies. And, you know, some of it maybe go a little bit too far into kind of utopian future, but, the, you know, there's a, there is a real movement behind it and you can really feel that in this industry. So. I'd like to get your take on decentralization on you know both of those architecture and, and philosophy and is that something that you saw come in as a as a you know as your time heading the uh, the market research company well yeah as I said up front I got involved in the whole mini computers early and client server and things like that so uh, I, I saw that and I saw real world customers gaining business benefits uh, from it I, I think that it's important for computer buyers, planners, thinkers to, to realize that uh, the, the criteria differ project by project. So for example, it, it's a lot easier in a cloud environment to put massive amounts of security in front of everything, more so than I as a consumer can do. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm worried about latency and gaming and things like that, I want the edge to be closer to me for, for all the obvious physics and the speed of light reasons. Uh, so I'm, uh, you're trading off a dozen or dozens uh, of different attributes like, like privacy, like backup and recovery. If my house burns down, do I have an, an off-site backup of my data besides the multiple ones that I do in my house right now. Uh, all of those play a role. But I think the psychology it has changed, as well as the fact that we now have the technology that enables 
people to look at, well, I can do it myself. I can grab these open source tools or I can grab the, the projects that are built on these open source tools that actually do things different from those uh, which, which I might otherwise pay good money for. And so uh, I, I basically see that continuing and, and, and have been flow, depending on individual preferences. Different countries will do things different ways, et, et cetera. Absolutely. And c- can you see the, um, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but it is an interesting conversation and it comes up a lot, but do, do you see the kind of uh, the big, big tech monopoly being um, diluted over the kind of next decade because of the rise of decentralized platforms or networks, should I say? Uh, yes and no. The, the, the yes is that uh, certainly at the consumer level, nobody cares whether Netflix runs on a server at their neighbor's house or on Amazon, which in fact is where it lives. Uh, people don't care. It's just deliver me my movies when I ask for them. Uh, on the other hand, big corporations, which have made multi-billion dollar investments to get rid of their HP servers and move to some big cloud provider or another, are going to be loath to move off of that just because of inertia, frankly. Uh, so, but we're talking around the gorilla in the room, which is uh, uh, kudos and what y- you all intend to do in the not too distant future. Uh, I think there's a, a great opportunity and that some of the immediate areas that you're going after are the most uh, obvious and the low hanging fruit, such as mining uh, and, uh, and gaming, both of which need, need servers can use local computing. And on top of that, uh, the business computing is likely to come from uh, project-oriented middle management who have a job that needs to get done by Monday morning for a presentation, come hell or high water, my job's on the line. And that happens all the time. So if I can get my rendering done or my video fly through of the project, whatever it is, and there are lots of compute heavy applications in every industry, but certainly in design of anything, of circuits, of buildings, uh, of uh, machines, etc., cetera, uh, all, all can use that and all could be distributed out in the network that uh, Kudos is building. Thank you, and that's, that's certainly what we're out to achieve. And um, yeah, it, it is, is, is interesting you, you, you placed it like that. Um, there is such a demand for computing power that is only gonna keep going up and up and up for the foreseeable future anyway, you know, until we, until we have uh, biological chips, or we're storing, you know, um, DVD, you know, storing films and videos and photos in our DNA, which which is being, you know, that is happening in labs. So it's, it doesn't seem that sci-fi when you, um, um, you know, when you when you kind of look back and realise what we've achieved over the last twenty years, hundred years, right? So right. It's, it's it's incredible. Um, so I don't think we tr- we truly know yet on on how that's going to look, but um, you know, we're we're there to be an alternative. We're not there to replace these big ones because you know like you said there's there's an incredible inertia behind them and um and they achieved that network for a long time ago <laughs> right <laughs> no, long long time ago so um good stuff so uh, i mean like moving on to um you know, the kind of what well, how everything is is evolving so quickly and we just start talking about biological processes there by 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 accident but you know what in the what, what are you what's kind of particularly exciting you in in the world of computer and um, advances in areas and what we can do yeah sure um, I, I think it's finally proven right that Scott McNeely who was the CEO co-founder of Sun Microsystems back in the 90s said the network is the computer and I will say today that we may not have noticed it happening, but it has happened. The network is the computer, and no one really cares where the resources are, things get done, and you more or less know how they get done, but it doesn't matter anymore. Whereas in the early days, say, of PCs, 
you knew exactly which board and which driver and which IRQ you had to use in the software. It was wickedly difficult. Not so much anymore. Uh, when I gave speeches in the data warehouse arena in the 1990s, I, I came up with a, a model for a, a funnel that said that the work that got done would more and more be done by automatic computing systems that would help human beings and do the routine work. Now, at the time, I was thinking of database stored procedures and rules-based systems, which were the state of the art at the time. Uh, but uh, today, it's, it's clearly artificial intelligence and other approaches to big data, et, et cetera. So in that sort of environment, you see the human being with the mind that is still, probably, well, for my lifetime, superior to any computing system, being used for error correction and detection, for compliance reason, things like that. That can get sent to a human. But the routine stuff, as I kind of said earlier about smart contracts, did the buy happen? Did the sell happen? Are they matched? Do we have the money? Yes. Done. Record it. Go move on. Don't bother a human being. Uh, that's yeah. going to happen. So as prelude, so the hard things to get done, let me start with that, will be uh, things like autonomous driving. I've got some very well-conceived thoughts on that, and one of them is autonomous driving software ought to be open source, owned by the world. There's no possible reason why Mercedes, BMW, Ford, GM, Tesla, etc., China, should have their own proprietary versions of autonomous driving software so that they can all kill human beings as they get the bugs out. Have an open source kernel like Linux and, and um, fix it there and it'll be highly reliable software, which is what you need in something that's speeding down the road at 100 kilometers an hour. Mm -hmm. Uh, number two, artificial intelligence right now is basically working the way I described folding at home, brute force. Think of the enormous amount of, wor of work to, to train AI systems as brute, brute force. So um, much work needs to be done there. How it will turn out, a combination of hardware and software, I'm pretty sure. And then thirdly, there's, uh, there's business, there's interesting things that will happen in the metaverse and augmented virtual reality. Uh, today, you know, you can't fit it into eyeglasses because it needs the power of Apple's most powerful cell phone, but you don't have room to put the battery in your headset and you'd burn it up in 20 minutes. So there are problems in physics there, but, mm -hmm. you know, we'll see very useful augmented reality things come along. Now, where does uh, the, the, the waves point? I think in areas of simulations, for example, weather and climate uh, would be our huge consumers of uh, more and better computing. You've got the whole gaming and the development of entertainment with uh, computer generated graphics. Again, they're huge. And as I've said, it, it, creating AR and VR uh, either for games or in whatever the real world becomes uh, is important. Uh, third, I talk about payment systems, the fact that more and more you're going to move to the blockchain, and we have smarter and smarter devices, so slam your, your phone down on the chip reader, and that's the transaction. You know, it, it shows up as a receipt on your watch a second and a half later. It can't get any better than that, right? And then uh, fourth is we looked on the blockchain to improvements in the whole arena of uh, personal and other privacy, to identity, to contracts and workloads themselves. Uh, so that, uh, that covers a lot of work for an awful lot of computer si uh, workers. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely fascinating. I, I agree with so many of those points there. I kind of got a little bit distracted at one point as well, and I started thinking of um, uh, you know, in, in, in the metaverse as that evolves, as we, we start going deeper, deeper, deeper in the virtual world, well, they start selling physical world experiences and they kind of turn for the book. So <laughs> almost like an inception of some kind. Um, 
the book's already been written. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about your kind of transition to an angel investor. So after after your you know years within the computing industry, um, you kind of took it to a different turn. I, I sort of backed into that, and if I had sat down up front and had a conversation with my wife, it wouldn't have happened. But uh, you know, I started out with some some friends and and family backing projects and then got into some private investing and over time realized that I, I personally really enjoy working with uh, generally younger people who have great ideas and huge amounts of energy uh, but I've got 50, 60 years of experience in my head and the, the uh, answers may change but the questions remain the same and mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of the questions. Uh, so that's gotten me into a local group uh, of angel investors in the Savannah area. And we regularly go through uh, ideas and presentations and look to see whether it makes sense. And some of them we, in, we um, mm -hmm. invest in as individuals within this umbrella framework. And with, with your kind of um, your own uh, passion for like folding at home, are you looking at kind of biotech and different areas of tech? Or, or have you got an even broader of them? Um, uh, portfolio is it out in, in other industries as well? Uh, I'll invest in anything that that I can understand, mm -hmm. and if somebody else understands, is that that's even better. So mm -hmm. the the group that I'm in in the last three years, I've invested in uh, in a number of uh, medical devices, for example, not so much drugs because they take an awful long time to bring to market. Uh, the latest company that we're going to bring it will be uh, a company that uh, franchises uh, healthy food small stores that they put in on college campuses and that looks like it m might have some legs uh, there's a company that's doing artificial intelligence based on uh, skin diseases so facial not recognition but l looking at uh, uh, skin problems and seeing how they, they might be helped as, an, as another one, for example. Um, Grain-based uh, milk. Uh, so all, all sorts of things. There's Fantastic. a lot of ideas out there. There is, um, I was listening to um, BBC Radio 4. Uh, I live in the UK, by the way, so you could, you could tell, but mm -hmm. BBC Radio 4 on the way back from a blockchain event last weekend up in Cambridge and uh, they were talking, there's a startup in, in East London and they were talking about how they've made um, cowless dairy. So it is dairy, right? So they're using the, they're using the proteins, they're using the bacteria mm -hmm. to, to create in, uh, the, uh, the, the milk, the cheese. Uh, they're actually focused on cheese because obviously there's a lot of companies coming out with alternative milk, so they you know, focus right. on the cheese. Yes. But without a cow in sight, Right. And uh, this is without any gene editing or anything along those lines. It's just using the the, the actual building blocks of uh, you know of what that uh, of what that cheese is in a, in a lab type environment. I just yeah thought it was fascinating. Right. So you still get the same taste. Yes, you do. Uh, and Absolutely. there's a lot of science and computing behind that. Didn't just happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I think this is this is it. Right. This is why we're seeing these uh, these um, what I call technology ways. You know, evolution or whatever that's going to well, be uh, the terminology for it. But it's it's because there's the, the, there's an ever growing amount of computing power. It's just getting to the, those calculations, to those decisions, to the you know quicker uh, than before. And it's 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 that's what's kind of speeding it up. Right. Um, but yeah, absolutely absolutely fascinating when you hear some, um, some of the ideas that are being innovated right now. So, if uh, just just to finish it off, Pete, because this has been a you know an absolutely brilliant uh, conversation. I've you know really appreciate having you on the show. But I like to kind of wrap it up with uh, kind of final thoughts. Um, and uh, so, if you were to give advice to a group of final year computing students right now, what would it be? Uh, it would be know what you want want in life. If you want money, for example, follow the money uh, and. That would be to uh, the city in London or, or Wall Street where huge amounts of salaries and stock options and stuff uh, or early coins in a DeFi project have been made uh, by people who can write algorithms, know the math, stuff like that. Uh, I would 
not be able to apply for those jobs. But uh, you know, the, the, there, if you if money is important to you, then there's a track for that. But uh, for everybody else, n- n- you need to know what business or social problem that you want to solve. And by that I mean understand the business, because the technology all, always changes. It's constantly changing. We've talked about a dozen different waves over the. 60 years of, of my career that started early in commercial computing. Uh, and if you know the business, you can then turn that around to what's the best technology to apply to it, and you'll have more fun doing it. Fantastic. That is great advice. Um, everyone that's tuned in, thank you very much. This um, Pete Kastner has been the guest on the Kudos Cast today. And I uh, hope you've uh, very much enjoyed it from wherever you're listening into today. So, uh, yeah, Pete, thanks again. And uh, a huge shout out to everyone uh, that has tuned into this week's Kudos Cast. It's been a blast. Thanks.